look at um, electron configurations. Uh, this lesson is going to be a little bit more of advanced techniques. So hopefully you've watched the video lesson on orbital diagrams and the video lesson on how to write electron configurations. So I'm going to assume that you already know how to uh, draw electron configurations. This would be the complete version. So you're starting from 1s all the way to the end uh, with the last electron for this particular element, which is sel selenium. Uh, and then the abbreviated uh, version. So hopefully you know how to draw these two types of electron configurations. If not, go back and watch those other two videos. Alright, so one thing that we want to look at and what's important in chemistry is the valence electron. Uh, those valence electrons are the ones found in the outermost energy level. Okay, so what that means is that you're going to find the highest n value, the one that has the highest n. Remember n, if you're looking at electron configurations, just to recap here real quick, the number in the front here number in the front right here that number there is n equals okay and then the s tells us the shape of the orbital so what these are doing is they're describing the orbitals that the electrons are sitting in and then the number here is the number of electrons okay alright so what we're looking for for valence electrons is the highest number here so we're looking for a 4 and a 4 so for selenium we're going to have four electrons from the 4p and two electrons from here. So there would be six valence electrons. So be careful with following um, off bow or the off bow principle because you're looking at it's it's confusing because it's elect, it's quantum mechanics and that's that's the problem here. Uh, we're looking at the highest energy level, which is energy level four, and energy level four has six electrons. We ignore the three Ds because they're technically in the energy level three. Okay, so it's a little confusing because you would think, well, why isn't that over here? It's just a result of quantum mechanics. We don't really get into it at this level as to why this happens as much, except for the fact that I've mentioned in the past that it's due to overlapping orbitals, okay, because the orbitals overlap each other. So what you're looking for here are the six valence electrons for selenium. Uh, abbreviated notation makes it a little bit easier because we remove all of those inner core electrons. So with the, uh, the noble gas configuration right here are your inner core electrons. So those are the electrons that are inside the nuclei, or not in the nucleus, but that are closer to the nucleus. And then what's left on the outside is usually your valence electrons. Just be careful because if you get to um, that 3D orbital, you'll still see that 3D in here. So you're looking for the highest n value. So that number is what you're looking for for electron configurations for finding the uh, valence electrons. Last filled orbitals, uh, sometimes they ask you questions about this. Last filled orbital just means what orbital is filled at the end. And let me show you on the periodic table, it makes it a lot easier to find all this information than actually um, using the configurations. But let's, let's take a look. Last filled orbital is just that orbital at the very end. So I'll circle the last filled orbital and the last filled orbital and the last filled orbital. And a lot of students think that the last filled orbital is the number of valence electrons. And for the most part, it can be. Uh, but be careful because you have the 2s and the 2p, 2s or 4s and 4p, and then watch out for 4ds and stuff like that. Okay, all right. So let's take a look at one way we can figure out um, electron configuration, or I'm sorry, valence electrons and orbital last field orbital on the periodic table. Okay, so here's the periodic table. If I were looking at selenium, selenium is here. It's number 34. If you remember before, I told you guys that we have valence electrons are right here. So this would be one valence. Oops, wrong pen. Uh, this would be one valence electron, two valence electrons. You would drop the one out and you would just say three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if I want to know how many valence electrons, to be honest, I'm not really going to be looking at um, the electron configurations for most of the elements. If I'm looking for selenium, I'm going right here. Selenium is here. So six valence electrons for selenium is what we would have based on its position on the periodic table. Arsenic would have five, carbon would have four, helium would have eight. So I can get that just by looking at the numbers on the top of the periodic table. And again, we're disregarding the tens. Uh, now, if you're looking at the transition metals or inner transition metals, most likely be the transition metals, you need to probably draw out the configuration. But to be honest, if you have a transition metal, uh, it's always going to be two because you're going to have the four uh, S here, the five S, and this is always three. D and 40, so it's always one less. So the valence electrons for these guys are always going to be these uh, elements over here. And you'll see that one of the homework problems you guys will work on. Uh, and then the last thing was the, or the other thing was the last filled orbital. So if I were to try to figure out the last filled orbital for selenium, okay, since selenium is here, last filled orbital is going to be whatever this this position is on the table. Remember, we can read this from left to right. So this would be one, two, three, four, five. So this is a four, a four right here. Can't draw the four. 
uh, 4s, 3d, 4p. So this is 1, so it would be a 4p, 1, 2, 3, 4 is the last filled orbital for selenium. Uh, last filled orbital for iodine, that would be for selenium. And the last filled orbital for iodine would be um, 5, oops, let's read that again, 5, P, and that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 5P, 5 would be the last field orbital for this. So you just kind of figure out where it's positioned, and sometimes it's a quick way to figure out if you understand the configurations and can read um, the periodic tables and stuff. All right, um, two other things we're going to look at. One is the configuration for ions. Okay, since we have ions, we can remember the loss of electrons, gaining of electrons. So if I have sodium, sodium tends to lose an electron. So when it loses an electron, it's going to lose its valence electron. Its valence electron is going to go away. So what it's going to leave behind is the configuration for neon. And that's why sodium becomes stable, because neon has that stable configuration where its orbitals are filled. Sodium doesn't. Sodium has that, that valence electron sitting there with a half-filled orbital, and that's unstable. And that's where stability comes from, It's having the orbitals filled. So what happens is that it's configuration of neon. So it's better to write neon's configuration like this. We don't typically write it like this for, for ions. We would write out the configuration for neon. All right, for boron, it's going to lose these three electrons. And that's why boron becomes a positive three, because it's going to lose these three electrons to become like helium. So we'll have a configuration that of helium or, if you want, 1s2. All right, so for the anions, the opposite happens. We're going to gain. So here I have four electrons. I need two more to fill that 3p orbital because the 3p has, uh, you know, three boxes here, three orbitals. So I have one, two, three, four. What I need to do is I need two more electrons. I'm going to put in here one and two. So therefore, for sulfur, uh, sulfur is going to need to have two more electrons added to its structure. And when it does that, it becomes just like argon. So again, we see that noble gas configuration popping up. And that's what the elements are all achieving. They all achieve still noble gas configurations. Why? Because that's where stability is found. It's found because it takes too much energy to gain another energy level. And it's obviously unstable because it's got the half-filled orbitals. Nitrogen the same way. Nitrogen is going to gain 3. And it's going to be the opposite of boron. And it will fill the, the, three, the two Ps to make it 6, which is, again, again just like neon. Okay, so make sure you can write configurations for ions as well as regular elements as well. All right, so let's take a look at the last thing today, which is two exceptions to all of these rules. As we've seen with the models we've looked at, we started with the uh, plum pudding, no, we started with the Democritus idea of the atom, moved to the uh, um, Dalton's model, then to the plum pudding model, and so on. We can see that there's always these problems with the models, and there's still problems with this model, even though it's very, very good and it's very useful and has a lot of applicability to uh, uh, solving a lot of problems, it also arises that it's not complete yet. So there, there is still that ongoing question of what's going on. So here's the two exceptions you need to know. You're not going to have to explain why, you just have to know that these two are not written the way they are. Why? Because experimental data shows us that this is not the way these configurations are, and that would be for chromium and copper. These are two exceptions. You can kind of see where they are in the periodic table. Chromium is here, Copper is over here, so there's what they're, what they're doing is they're almost half filled orbitals and they're almost completely filled. So this D is actually better when it's half filled than when it's almost half filled. So it's better to half fill both of these orbitals than it is to fill one of them and not half fill the other one. Again, why gets beyond the scope of this course? It's just something you're going to have to recognize. Okay, so this this is the exception. So these are wrongs. You would not write this configuration. You would not write this configuration. Again. Notice this is going to be a 10 as opposed to this one is better to have filled than to have this one filled. Why? Again, I can't answer that. It goes beyond the scope of the course. You just have to recognize that copper is going to be written like this and chromium is like this. Okay? And this explains why we get copper plus ones, by the way. I mean, we get copper because this valence electron goes away, and when it does, it's going to then drop down an electron back into that. We can get coppers one and copper two by looking at that configuration with it here, all we would be able to get is a copper plus two. So again, even though it doesn't seem to make sense, it does explain the reason why we have multiple charges for copper. All right, I'll talk to you guys in class. Thanks a lot.